Welcome everyone to the 46th episode of Everyday Channel. We are finally back and today we got a special guest. We got Marius Hausmann from Germany. Marius, say hello. Hi there. And with us tonight is my co-host Matt Pavlik from Vancouver. You probably know Matt if you've ever played Legacy or any kind of Eternal anywhere in the world. You might have heard of him. Hello, Matt. Hello, hello. Not with us today is Bob, who's apparently busy finding a new roommate after Anorak has decided to leave him to pick up a job in the adult industry in, uh, I think it was San Diego or something. So if you're looking to live with a legacy guy in, are they living in Boston? I think so. Somewhere uh, on the East Coast, yeah. Yeah, somewhere on the East Coast. Was it, wasn't it around Washington? Yeah, th there, there's Bob waiting for you. So, big news. We have GP Seattle around the corner. It's um, going to be on this weekend. And Matt, you just told me it's actually not going to be a Saturday-Sunday weekend. But uh, do they do this thing where they start the GP early again? Yeah, so I think the Legacy event is actually starting on the Friday and going to the Saturday. Because there's a bunch of different events going on. Oh, is it like a double GP weekend then? I think so. Uh, like they did... Oh, it's the same in Europe, where they start the Legacy GP in Birmingham also a day early. Which is unfortunate, because uh, I think you can't make it, and I guess there's going to be a lot of people who just can't make it in time, because like most of the Legacy or Eternal players are more like older, and they have jobs, and it's really hard to like get a day off. So I'm curious what the attendance numbers are going to be. Like, Is there something that we are shooting for, something that you would consider like a decent turnout? I'd like to see 1,500 Legacy players in the main event. Oh, okay. Okay, 50. I, I was hoping uh, we would get like over 2,000, but 1,500 I mean, for a Friday event. For a Friday yeah. event, yeah. But I hear there's a like pretty big uh, legacy scene around Seattle, right? It's always considered like one of the capital cities of the format. Oh, yeah, for sure. The legacy in Seattle is premium. I mean, the store support in the area is really, really good thanks to uh, Mox Boarding House and such. So, I mean, it's if you get a chance, if you get a chance to go to, they have a Wednesday event. So I guess that would be in three days or so. Uh, they're running a, uh, I think it's a duels tournament, like a four under round C for first sort of like old school. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> like back in the day, you know, a set of uh, C's for first set of Volks for second sort of, uh, sort of deal. So if you're in the area early, which I would hope that you would be, uh, check out Mox Boarding House or Cafe Mox or whatever the, whatever the name of the store is. I can't remember. Oh. I actually remember that, like the last uh, Legacy GP in Seattle, they posted a picture from their Wednesday event, might have been, and it had well over 100 people playing in a, like, quote unquote, random uh, event on a weekday, which was quite, quite amazing to me. It is amazing. I would definitely suggest yeah. anybody if they have the chance to go. Yeah, Marius and I are not going. Like, I really wanted to go, but couldn't really make it this year. And I think Marius also had no plans to go, but we are hitting the Legacy GP in Birmingham in May. Um, but Marius, like not a lot of, actually, I guess these days you could say a lot of people do know you, but uh, for everyone who doesn't know Marius, he's um, a one-time le German legacy champion. He also has four MKM top eights, including a win at, I want to say MKM Milan with Food Chain a year ago or something. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Also made uh, top eight at Ovino Gaddon and I think various like mid-sized tournaments all around Europe, like they always at these mid-sized tournaments uh, at some legacy legacy uh, GPs. Uh, I was always around forty plays, but never really made it into top sixteen or top eight. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, in Birmingham, I don't know. You're you're playing at, or at least it looks like you're going to play a deck that you once told me you will never ever touch again. Like. When I got into Legacy in Munich, you were kind of like the end boss of the Legacy scene, not only in, in Munich, but also soon, like, pretty much in Germany. It felt like playing decks like Slanstel and Dreadstel, also Maverick later on. And then it felt like you, you had been lost for quite a while, like you didn't really know what to play. Then you had some really, really decent success with De uh, Death in Texas, uh, which is when you told me that you will never, ever lay hands on Delva in days again. And now I still have like, to say I uh, <laughs> I um, would love to play Death in Texas in the in the format, but it does not feel good. I played it in the last year at some tournaments still, but uh, always had the problem that just the card quality could not uh, fit up with the check pile stuff with cards like Kulagans Command, Deathrite Shaman, and so on. And yes, the card quality is just a bit too low at the moment for playing Death in Texas, I guess. 
So, how do you feel about Crixus Delver? Like, I hear it, it has been treating you quite well, <laughs> as I experienced in the Legacy Challenge yesterday, where I lost to you in the top eight. You actually went all the way to the finals and came back from what looked like a really, really disadvantaged position to take down the entire tournament. So, even though you don't like Delver, you must feel pretty ecstatic about, about the deck, don't you? As you said, I'm still not a fan of Delver of Secrets and Days. <laughs> I, I just hate but, these cards. But you do like winning. <laughs> Winning is pretty good, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, <laughs> I like winning very much. That's no question. But sometimes Delver and Days really feel like cards you don't want to draw in the mid game when opponent has all the mana he wants and your, uh, your Delver face some baleful tricks or stuff like that. But nevertheless, I have to say, Grixis Delver is at the moment absolutely top tier legacy deck with cards that are just too good not to play them. Namely, Chitexian Probe with Cable Therapy, which I play in the main deck. Yeah. And, <laughs> and of course, Deathrite Shaman. Um, I very often discussed with Julian that uh, banning of Deathrite Shaman would have or would, would be healthy for Legacy. Meanwhile, I'm not too sure about this because if you ban Deathrite, you have, again, a problem that Reanimate might get too strong piles like Dredge and so on. But I really played much Grixis Delver and there are so many matches, especially in the mirror, where turn one, Deathrite Shaman, bolt the enemy Deathrite Shaman, raise the land is already GG. It's a bit uh, stupid. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, I remember that current Eternal Weekend champion uh, Hans Jakob Godding from Denmark. He once told me that, like, when you play, when you're playing bug decks or far color decks with Deathrite Shaman, the most important thing is to what he calls establish the Deathrite Shaman advantage. So he will pretty relentlessly like force a failure turn one Deathrite Shaman most of the time just to get rid of it because he feels like it's such such a big advantage. It's worth throwing a force of it at it, which should probably tell you a lot about this. Also combined with the fact that someone like Marius and like if you don't Marius it's probably like hard to understand but there's probably not a single player in the world who's as opposed to playing uh, Delva and Days as him so I, I just can't repeat this and he's still picking up the deck yeah so I was hoping we could avoid the, the um, Deathwatch Shame ban discussion now that Bob isn't here we, he's being pretty vocal about like wanting to see the card gun and I guess now we're getting so what, into that what anyway did he say? what did Bob say about Deathrite? Um, he wrote a couple of articles and he's been also pretty vocal about it on podcasts that he thinks that it's like, it doesn't diversify the mid the meta game. It, it makes it more like homogenized. Like you play all the same decks, like between Buck, Leowald and Four Color. And uh, basically the entire idea of this is that there's like the Buck, the so-called Buck shell. And then you either add like, I don't know, Aluren, Food Chain, um, or just play straight up Delva or go into Four Color. Even like, Elves can sometimes play a little... I guess Elves is a different kind of Death Lord deck, but sometimes, like especially in post book games, I also feel like more like a bug deck where I have Death Lord Shame, Shame the Prop Decay and Value cards. And like Bob's idea is that we would see a lot more different decks in Legacy right now. And he also discredits the thing that like st stuff like Dredge or Reanimator would be too strong, which I agree with. I think we could still easily fight those decks. Um, but I'm also not the kind of guy who will push for a Deathwatch Shaman ban. I don't mind it all that much, but I would also be interested to see what things would look like if it were banned, but it's not like I really actively want it banned. Uh, people are, uh, sometimes tell me, like, would elves be unplayable? No, I think elves would actually still be playable if Deathwatch was gone. Um, but I don't know. For me, it's just like I would see to, I would like to see either option explored. I think at the end of the day, there will always be uh, the possibility to complain about certain cards in Legacy. I uh, know back the times where we both uh, were so happy when they played Sen Sensei's Divining Top after I don't know how many years. I wanted to uh, for 10 We years. suffered from this card, yeah. Um, but just imagine take Deathrite out of the format and then the complaints start again about Chalice of the Void, about Show and Tell, Grizzlebrand. Yeah, I think uh, the list about uh, the list of strong, really strong cards in Legacy is uh, that big that uh, it's not so easy to just ban ban one card and be happy happy uh, with it. That's true. That's true. I think uh, Death Watch wouldn't be the kind of card that would be banned for quality anyway. But I I can certainly see your point that like where do you go from there like. We probably wouldn't still would feel pretty bad about Show and Tell being in the format ever since Crystal Brand came around. So, would be the next step to ban Show and Tell. And 
always like proceed forward until we got the quote unquote perfect meta game. And I, I, I agree that that would probably be like a problematic approach. But going back to, to Grixis server, we recently looked at the meta game, and depending on whether you look at single tournaments where it had a day two penetration of sometimes like 30% or something, uh, if you look at the general meta game on, say, MTG top eight, it currently stands at 14%, which is already quite high. Like, Marius probably and Matt also remembers these days when Canadian Threshold always used to be 9%, and everybody was going crazy about 9% and how no deck could ever go above that. And now we are left with what people consider like the two kings of the format, Krix Estelva and Jack Pale, also known as Four Color Control, sometimes making up almost 50% of certain tournament meta games on day two. So how does everyone feel about start, starting with Krix Estelva? Like Marius already mentioned that it's good enough for him to even pick up the deck. What has been your impression of Krix Estelva in Legacy right now? I think we have, uh, if we look at the online meta game, we have uh, some advantages of Grixis Delva um, if we compare it to any other control or uh, yeah, let's say another blue deck. First of all, you have quite short rounds. You don't have to grind the full 50 minutes for your round. You have rounds that can be over in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And uh, you play your league in, let's say, one or two hours. Then you have, with Grixis Delva, an extremely versatile deck. You have the tools to beat any other deck in the format. Of course, you have better matchups, you have worse matchups. Um, but if you compare it to Canadian Threshold, it's... Uh, Back in the time, Canadian was always a deck where you had your, let's say, 55% if you were was uh, if you were a good player against the whole meta. And this is true with Greeks level 2, I guess. You can win in any matchup. And if you don't win game 1, you have the sideboard tools to win any other matchup. Yeah, what fascinates me about Greeks Estelva is that it can easily produce, especially when it's on the play, starts that are almost impossible to beat. Like, say you go turn one Deathfly Shaman, turn two uh, Young Pyromancer Probe, double therapy flashback. Like, what the fuck? It's at that point, some of the games almost feel over, especially like. If you play it in the main. Um, yeah. Most of the guys that play the deck, they don't play the therapy in main. They play two spell peers because they say, okay, opponent uh, shall pay mana for his spells, and I have the advantage in countering it for only one mana. But. I see main reason for playing Greek Delver is the synergy between Pyromancer, Chitexian Probe, and Therapy. And this is a fact where Bob agrees to me too. I just talked about him three days ago, and he plays two copies of Cable Therapy in the main too. Oh, okay, so did he switch it up? Because like it felt like for a while everybody was copying the list that Bob pretty much established that had the therapies in the sideboard. But he's been unhappy about that, and he also told me that, especially for the mirror, it's being kind of annoying because he's trying to break the mirror, and every time he finds something, it gets invalidated by some other choice, choices people make. So it's kind of funny that for for him, the only real concern right now is the mirror, which kind of reminds me a bit of the days when when everybody in Europe played Maverick, and like the, the mirror was what everybody had like complaints about. So honestly, I bought it out in the mirror. I bought out therapies in the mirror, um, but. I think there's a difference between the online meta of MTG online and uh, Paper Magic. In Paper Magic, you face quite often uh, random piles, how I call them. And playing Sea for example. Um, you, you know me, you know me well. Uh, I'm often quite frustrated when I lose against, let's say, Boggles in modern <laughs> or. Uh, Hey, Boggles is a legit deck, you know. What was this, what was this blue card in, in oh, Legacy? Oh, Thoughtlash. <laughs> Thoughtlash. Uh, yes, I was really done with the tournament. Still had a better result than my opponent, but I lost this match. Oh, yeah. You, you didn't top eight uh, the, the 600 people Legacy uh, tournament, or was it like four or 500 Legacy tournament in Frankfurt uh, like one or two years ago? I remember that. <laughs> oh, that was, yeah. Matt, you, you, your thoughts? Sometimes it feels good to beat Marius with bad cards, so he tilts. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, have you guys actually met? Like, I'm pretty sure you met at um, Prague Eternal 2015. Yeah, I, I, I know Matt. He's a fine guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's the man with uh, all all the money in the world. Oh, 
Oh, I remember when Matt came to Prague and he played his summer basic lands and people were giving it a look and like, oh, look at that guy playing in a suit and a tie and his summer basic lands. <laughs> I remember that. That was a good that was a good trip. Oh, it was an amazing trip. <laughs> <laughs> and we played in- when you convinced me to randomly head to GP Copenhagen and then we slept in Mark's uh, grandparents' cabin. Uh, well, but not a beach house. Yeah, Kevin. Kevin, I guess you want to say. Yeah, and then we used Google uh, Translate basically to communicate with them. It was amazing. <laughs> And they tried tried to poison us with those salty fish snacks or whatever oh. it was. It was kind of crazy. Yeah. It was a good. I actually wanted to send them flowers, but I didn't. Oh, I'm we so can bad. still send them. <laughs> <laughs> like randomly, two years after. <laughs> It'd be three years now. Deep fried true name nemesis. Deep fried true name nemesis. Yeah, true name nemesis. Apparently, Tasty. it's it's a real card in the meta game again. Like it's been gone for a while after it was printed. Like everybody was super crazy about it. Then it vanished, and now for the last. 12 or 6 or 12 months it's been a real card in legacy oh you know why terminus oh yeah that's right oh you oh okay that's terminus was a card but terminus a card was a card before well i think i think top was banned april of last year right so it's been about a year it's the anniversary of (laughs) yeah it lasted so long until i found a finally a solution against miracles which was called food chain had a really Great matchup against Miracles, and then three months after I won MKM Milano with it, they banned uh, Miracles. And I was excited, yeah, Death in Texas again, and then zero true drop against Czechpile, Czechpile, blah. Yeah, about Death in Texas. I was wondering because over the last couple of weeks, there have been several threads on Reddit, and I think also some people brought it up on the source, why Death in Texas has been in such a decline, like... It doesn't really put up the big numbers anymore, even though it's played a lot online still, because I guess it used to be kind of a cheap deck until port got like super expensive. But for a lot of people, I think the turning point was when they re- realized that basically the grandfather of the deck, Thomas Innevolsen, stopped playing it and had also switched to Checkpile for his uh, top two run at GP Madrid with his team. And people started wondering what happened to the deck. And Marius also put down the deck, even though I wanted him to keep playing the deck for quite a while. But eventually I had to agree that like he had a good point about it not being as great as it used to be anymore. So Marius, tell us, why do you not like Death and Texas in this meta game right now? First of all, you just gave me uh, a list with the current meta game. And funny enough, their Death and Texas is still listed as an aggro deck. It's not an aggro deck, it's a control deck. But aside from this, the problem about Death and Texas is I don't see, except for Delver decks, any good matchup. And I guess the good Delver matchup, it doesn't matter whether uh, Grixis is Delver or Team America, is the reason that so many uh, players keep taking the deck on Magic Online. If you if you look Magic Online, the, this um, quite successful game, Mali Muyo, you know him, you talked with him. And Marimucho. Marimucho. <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, aside from elves, I don't have any bad matchup with Death in Texas. Okay, if you don't, if you play all day long against Grixis Delver, I might agree to this. But then you play against Checkpile and face Kolagans Command or Abrupt Decay on equipment. Strix might not, all, not be the problem, but Deathrite Shaman. Again, you try to deny the enemy mana and he just has a death right, and all your wastelands are quite useless. It's the same reason why Death in Texas sucks against elves. Normally the elves uh, player has all the mana in the world, and you can't deny him. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky matchup, because Death in Texas is kind of built around uh, restricting mana, and also making it hard to like have meaningful spells. Whereas elves is all about mana and playing creatures, and like the spells are also like quite game breaking. But when you have enough mana and are able to like draw cards as as freely as you can, um, then Death and Texas becomes quite embarrassing rather quickly. But what's interesting to me is that you still mentioned Delva as one of the last few reasons to play Death and Texas because I know that you you've also not been happy about the Crixus Delva matchup, where like. Even that deck now has the tools to put up quite the fight against Death in Texas. I was going to say, isn't a braid just amazing against Death in Texas? I don't estimate a braid a good card in Grixis Devil's Sideboard, sorry. <laughs> it's a two mana removal card where you can trade one for one, but I certainly prefer the two ancient grudges where you can get two for one. And if you want to handle creatures, I uh, would prefer two stuff like Lava Mancer, Marsh Casualties, Is It Steadicaster, which uh, create card advantage. A braid is 
It's a good card for Moonstone Peel because you don't have really other options. Um, but <laughs> it's kind of crazy thinking about it that we, we've got 25 years of magic and the best we could like get in that slot that doesn't cost one mana because of Chalice is a Braid. Mm. I mean, a Braid is a great card and it sees play in Vintage, but it's kind of funny that it took so long to print a card like that. Yeah, exactly. But I, I don't think I want this card in my uh, Grixis Delver sideboard. So what's the problem about Grixis Delver? Like you told me that stuff like Fork Bolt is, can be annoying. Um, also the, the mana that they have uh, of Deathlight Shaman. And I guess also after sideboarding, when they get stuff like Marsh Casualties, that can be pretty tricky for Death in Texas. Let's say after boarding, it's an um, even matchup with perhaps a light upside for the Death in Texas player. pre board you can really only squeeze out a win with Grixis Delver. If you have a fast Delver or second turn true name start and your opponent does not manage to get his equipment in play in time. But I think out of 10 games where my opponent started with a first round Aether Vile in game one of the match, I won two. That's not okay. really much. So overall, you wouldn't recommend people to keep playing Death and Texas? Like, if, if you're a guy, if you're one of our listeners and you have Death and Texas and you could play something else that you're not as familiar with, what would you say for the GP? Well, for, first of all, concerning Death and Texas, to bring this to an end, there are more than three people who asked me on Facebook about my current Death and Texas list and wanted uh, to get advices for Death and Texas. And I said to all of them, don't play this deck. If you want to go to the Grand Prix and want to play for fun, for casual, yeah, just take your Death and Texas, but don't expect to go to make day two with it. Because you don't only have the problem that you lose against these ultra grindy check piles or uh, stuff like Nick Fit. Uh, oh, it's, my, yeah. it's my nemesis, Nick Fit. Yeah. But I always see the, the big guy with the hat and long beard who plays <laughs> Peril, Chancellor of the Annex, Dark Ritual, Entium, <laughs> Rizzlebrand, Axiom. Have fun. <laughs> well played, sir. And with Death <laughs> Texas, you don't even have the tools to beat this deck. Yeah, you have Caracas. But that's all. Karaka still loses against Rieselbrand, draw seven and reanimate the next fatty. And normally stuff like Adnauseum or Tess, Tess even worse, they most of the time go on, go off turn one. They just kill you before you can land your first hate beer in form of Canonist or, or Talia. Really, I don't see any good matchup with Death in Texas aside from Delver decks. And even they, as you say, it have after boarding the tools to beat you. So bad news for everybody playing everyone playing Death in Texas in before we see like three copies in the top eight of GPC. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> of course. Of course. I mean if you get the right That's matchups, but it's it's much harder to get those. Yeah, variants can always like get you there. But I definitely agree that the deck isn't as good as I always wanted it to be. To me, it's always been like one of my favorite decks because it's so tricky. I know Mark Koenig, Barra, once said that playing the Death in Texas Mirror is the closest you will ever get to chess in, in Magic, which feels kind of appropriate. I really like that. Yeah, but, but at the moment, it's a chess where you have eight pawns and the opponent has four pawns and four towers. <laughs> Rooks, I think they're called. Yeah, yeah. So for everyone listening. What about the other big name in the room, the check pile, four color control, whatever you want to name it? Um, do you also like that deck? Because I know that you played like a stripped down version of it where you ended up cutting red and pretty much played back mid range. Yeah, Leoward I like the deck still very and much. And right um, I'm not sure whether I should not play this. Yesterday I had a quick talk with Andrea Mengucci who played it in a league. In a legacy league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> and uh, first he played a list of, of, of me, and then he took the list uh, from Lukas Blohorn, who played four copies of him, four Fatal Push, and he was quite content with the deck, but lost the last round against Moon Stumpy. And I always cheer for Moon Stumpy. If, if I see it, Stumpy, sorry, not Stumpy. <laughs> but... If we talk about Czech pile, I think we have various decks that are quite similar, but are only different in some cards. I see in this in this uh, meta list four color control, fifty two seven percent. That's the highest number uh, of all decks. And uh, decks, meanwhile, yeah. they are even more greedy 
four color control decks, which say, okay, I want to win the mirror. So what shall we do? Okay, we bring in Groove of the Burn Rillo and Punishing Fire. We even play more grindy. And then, in addition to this, we play Dark Faden because it has a good synergy with Puni <laughs> Punishing Fire. We play Leovolt, which is great with Dark Faden, so we play the greediest pile in the world. And it works. It works. And then, if you're even greedier, you, you add the six mana Chandra to the deck, I guess. I've seen All the planeswalkers you want Obnixilis, Chandra. <laughs> it starts feeling like a sealed format. <laughs> yeah, Highlander Reloaded. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I guess that's also why Grixis Dava can be good, because it, it tries to go under them. Um, but what has your impression been? Is Grixis Dava good against Checkpile? Uh, I think it's quite... An... The unstoppable force versus the immovable it's object. quite an even matchup uh, on, on the paper. On the paper, and in theory, it feels like Checkpile should crush Grixis Dava all over the time. Because you have four copies of Strix, Uh, all the removal in the world and uh, mass card quality and card advantage. But if you go in the games, you see again one of the uh, big strangers of Grixis Delver. The threats of the deck are very different. You have Pyromancer with creates many creatures. This is good against Diabolic Edict. You have Nemesis which is good against spot removal. And you have my favorite card in the deck, the zombie fish, Gormak Angler, which is good against the removal like Abrupt Decay, Lightning Bolt, Fatal Push. So in the end, I think in the matchup Grixis Delver versus Jackpile, it comes down on two points. First of all, who has the death right and who can keep it? And uh, second, who has the threats for which the other doesn't have the answers? Of course, if you have Fish and Pyromancer and opponent plays Strix, Strix, uh, Fatal Push your Pyromancer, you will lose. That's no question. But there are two of the games where, and you see with, with Probe, fair card in Legacy, very fair card. <laughs> That's the card I actually want gone from the format. And you see opponent has two Fatal Push in his hand. And say, okay, I brainstorm away my Death Rite and Pyromancer and try to find the true name and the zombie fish. And that might win the match. Yes, yeah, so the, the versatility of the threats that they have and the ability to find them or shuffle away the, the ones they don't use is what gets them ahead, which is quite interesting because Checkpile doesn't have the luxury of playing pro, but I guess they will see the threats as they come down and they can also shuffle away those answers and try to find something else. So it can become quite interesting match. Like I've never played it from either side. I've watched it a couple of times and I could certainly see it making for a pretty good game if both players are aware of these dynamics. Indeed, quite interesting. Accordingly. And I, I guess uh, Grixis Delver is um, way more comfortable to play against Checkpile than Team America, for example. Because Team America just has the mono dogs. Delver, Tarmogoyf, Doomstalker. They are all undercosted and good creatures, but normally Checkpile can handle them quite well. But that's the thing that I really like about Grixis Delver. With Pyromancer Therapy, you have this unfair factor about which we talked. You have games you can complete dominate with these two cards. True, true. So... Um, coming back to Matt, because Matt, I've known that you've been quite busy over the last couple of months, um, finishing your uh, last exams, I want to say, before you head out into the wild and become like the ultimate soldier. Um, I think you, are, you already completed basic training, right? Oh God, no, no, I still have to do that. Oh, so what's the crazy thing? Like they sent you to, to the, to the wilds and to the, on, to Vancouver Island to become this war machine, didn't they? They did, and there were there were helicopters, there were riverbeds, there were flybys, there were it was good, but uh, no, apparently that wasn't enough. So now it's learning how to kill a man. <laughs> so assuming you were to come to GP Seattle, and I know that you can't make it to the main event, unfortunately, but if you were to play in that, you've been out of the loop a little bit, I would say. Um, Do you have like any kind of questions that our listeners might have as well about the meta game, like about the positioning of certain decks or certain approaches to how to crack the meta game? Well, I guess everybody's going to ask, how do I beat Grixis Delver or how do I beat Four Color Control? I think that's everybody's main thing. Miracles is gone. 
the the control deck in question is going to be. I don't think miracles is going to be four. I don't and, think Matt. Well, old, I the way the way the old miracles dominate. Yeah. Right? Okay. That's that's true. That's true. But miracle is still present, and I really hate playing against miracles uh, on MTGO just because of the of the time factor. Oh, really? Yeah. T to me, it always felt like it, it hurts them way more than it does hurt the opponent. Yeah, but you play elves. <laughs> that's true, but I have to do a lot of clicking. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I guess the listeners are the listeners are going to wonder, just like myself, I'm bringing my whatever deck that I've played in Legacy forever, maybe, right? How do I beat Grixis Delver? What am I bringing in? It's four color, and how am I going to beat Combo and Miracles? So I have four different very wide strategies that I have to try and board against and say I'm, I'm bringing Death and Taxes, and Death and Taxes isn't as good, and I don't have time to switch or learn a new deck. I think that's going to be a lot of positions for a lot of different people. Well, how do we nut Grixis Delver? Okay, I think the best the best ways the best ways to beat Grixis Delver are certain enchantments because enchantments are the only card type that Grixis can't handle with none of the sideboard cards. So I suggest playing Blood Moon. I always suggest yep. playing Blood Moon, <laughs> um, but Blood Moon can really shut down Grixis Delver as long as it's not your only hate card. But combined with some uh, removal, Blood Moon can really shut Grixis Delver down. If you play, if you play, play green, you might bring cards like Choke or even Carpet of Flowers if you ha have a good way to use the mana you can generate with it. Or even stuff like Back to Basics. That uh, I witnessed quite often on MTGO in the last month that Blue White Stone Blade is coming back. If you look at the prices of Back to Basics on Magic Card Market, it's not funny. It costs 30 bucks, 30, 30 really? euros. Yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, it's man. only from Urza Saga, I guess. It's the only version of the card, and it's quite expensive. I bet Matt has like 50 of them stowed away in some, some box. I, somewhere. I have some Korean ones. You're, you are correct. Ah, send me one. <laughs> of course you I do. One place that I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but blue, white, stone blades... I know, Julian, you don't like Stoneforge Mystic for certain reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but you have a two-colored mana base with many, many basics, so Wasteland will not really disturb you. And with four swords to Plosius, you are quite safe in the in the early game. You have Supreme Verdict, which really handles all the threats of Grixis Delver and can't be countered. I think this deck has a really good edge against Grixis Delver. And I guess it should also have the tools to, to put up a fair fight against Checkpile. Yeah, back to basics is neither back against Checkpile, let's say it like this. And you can play uh, Planeswalkers like Gideon or Elspeth against which Checkpiles really struggles because they are out of DK range. And you can play Shackles. I'm yeah, just... in Kolagans Command time, I, I guess know, not. I'm just kidding. Okay. To me, it's been like Kolagans Command has secretly been the most defining or shaping card of the format right now because it's really pushed artifacts out of the format. Like, if you are trying to rely on artifacts uh, against these kind of decks, you're in for a bad surprise. Uh, I know in Elves that I used to run Chitte, sometimes even in the main deck, just to fight against the, the decks like Grixis Delver because you... Like, in theory, playing against Young Pyromancer, having Chitte is amazing, but then you realize, okay, there's Kolagans Command. And even though Grixis Delver doesn't run Kolagans Command anymore, they did for a while, um, Checkpile still does, and it's really, really punishing. Because most of the artifacts in the format, they require a lot of work to to do something. Like, I guess Wild is a different one, but also Wild, Wild takes, takes a while to become online. And people have been shying away for trying these artifacts. Also, like, I can only speak for the Elves perspective. Like, Meek Stone is a card that I would love to have in the form in, in the meta game right now. But I can't really afford to do that because when I bring in cards against Checkpile or Quicksilver Diver, I need them to hit really hard. And Meek Stone is too dangerous, especially since it only provides a temporary effect anyway. So I agree with Marius that enchantments are the way to go, which is quite different from what I said when Miracles was a deck. Like when Miracles was around, I told everyone don't play enchantments because it's enchantments don't provide a lasting effect. Like until they find the wear tier, yeah. uh, then you are screwed. Uh, and these days, I feel the exact opposite. Like if you have enchantments to to fight these decks, it's great. And you mentioned Blood Moon, you mentioned Choke, Carpet of Flowers. Even Rest in Peace shuts down all death rate shamans, shuts down therapy with flashbacks, shuts down the zombie fish. Uh, I remembered 
you actually suggesting running main deck rest in pieces to someone, but I didn't really follow the conversation, so I wasn't sure whether you were kidding. Or... Yeah, um, our, our, our friend, Le Canard, I suggested he could play two rest in peace in his death in Texas since he insists to play it in Birmingham. Why not? If, if he loves it, why not? I told him he could cut one revoker and one spirit of the labyrinth for two rest in peace in the main deck since this card is not only good against Grixis Delver but against pff, let's say 60 to 70 percent in the format and you spare two sideboard slots yeah that's something I always like a lot um, it goes back to to me playing elves but if, if I can free up more sideboard slots that that sounds amazing I guess there's a couple of decks that main deck rest in peace would be uh, weird against and you also have no way to really get rid of it but i guess that's just the the gamble that you enter into that you won't face those decks or at least not draw rest in peace when it's critical and against those decks so is it something like obviously you haven't tested it but is, is it something you consider worth exploring i consider it worth exploring yes as you said i really can't tell you whether it's broken or it's complete bullshit <laughs> it's just a thought i have about the format at the moment that rest in peace is really good rest in peace Energy field, that deck. Energy, energy field. field. Oh, like like in a in a blue white miracles rest in peace energy yeah. field kind of deck. And then you also even add like say helm of obedience. I guess that's exactly. Too then. No, but still, it's a kill. <laughs> and there is one guy on TG Online who always plays this deck. I honestly, I never lost against him, <laughs> but he has quite many trophies. Which one? He went quite often 5-0. Ada, Lit, and any number, I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, we will find him. him yeah, down. we will find him for sure. But that's, again, not the kind of deck which I uh, would like to play as, as a player. I always I always want to play creatures. If you see the decks I played, Maverick, Death in Texas. Landster. Yeah, okay. <laughs> They are not, but this is now... Well, you uh, played Eternal Dragon. And, that must count for something. Yeah, Eternal Dragon was awesome, <laughs> of course. Another card that fell victim to Deathrite Shaman. I guess it already stopped being a card long before that, but yeah. Um, one last deck I want to talk about is the aforementioned... Well, we used to call it Dragon Stompy. Some people call it Moon Stompy now, which is probably more descriptive of it. It's it's not really the new kit on the block anymore, but it has put up a lot of impressive results, putting like two people in the top four of GP Madrid and then repeating the performance at the following tournaments. And to me, I don't know what's so different about the deck, but in the past, these Stompy decks, they struggled with their own deck, sometimes not performing or delivering on what they promised. And I'm not exactly sure what it is, but this deck feels more consistent. It just feels better. I'd feel more comfortable playing this in a big tournament than say any of the old Stompy decks. I guess first of all, we should talk about two rule changes there. Because some months ago, there was this rule change that Dark Deaths under Blood Moon still produces the 2020 token if the Blood Moon dies. Oh, you, you mean, yeah, yeah, that, that, that if you have Blood Moon and you play Dark Depths, it doesn't get the tokens anymore. And then yeah. when the Blood Moon goes away, it immediately uh, produces the token. Yeah. And I just read yesterday that uh, with Dominaria, the upcoming expansion, there will another rule, rule change that your Chandras, which is uh, nowadays the out of four of includes, can't anymore deal damage to enemy planeswalkers. Oh, um, I didn't hear that, so I'd love to hear more. About yeah, that. they they changed the way uh, direct damage works. Yeah. And stuff like uh, Rolling Earthquakes, which I proudly presented you five days <laughs> ago, just does no damage to Planeswalkers with the upcoming expansion too. Yeah, so basically the way it works is they changed it so that you can't, like you don't redirect the damage on resolution to the Planeswalker. Instead, you have to aim it directly at the Planeswalker. And you can still do that with stuff like Lightning Bolt, which will actually get Errata to be able to target Planeswalkers. But yep. if it's if it's stuff that deals damage to the player directly, say price of progress and doesn't target, then you can't redirect that damage. So exactly. that, that's a change. Oh, that's a weird. I'm not sure why they do it now. I mean, I get the idea. A lot of people actually didn't know that. Like, if I play a, uh, if you have a chase and a counter spell, and I play lightning bolt on you, and they're like, "You mean on chase?" I'm like, "No, no, to you." And they're like, "Okay." And then it start writing down the life total, and then you're like, "Oh, on resolution, redirect to chase." And then they're like, hey, but you told me you were shooting at me. And they're like, hmm, you didn't know the rules. So I think it's a bit more intuitive, but the problem is that they have to errata so many cards, so it can get quite annoying. 
there must be a reason in, in the latest set they do this. Like every time they make these changes, it's usually about a new card they have printed. So overall, I'm not against the change. I just want to see how it gets implemented because the errata thing always rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. So Marius, you wanted to, to, to talk about that rule change and how it influences um, your decision or your estimation of the deck. Yes, the estimation of the deck... Aside from, from the rule change, which makes the deck a bit worse, not much, of course, but a bit, is that the deck could really be a solid choice for uh, GP Seattle and, of course, for Birmingham too, because you do the stuff that most of the deck in the format don't want. You have four copies of Blood Moon, four copies of Marcus of the Wound, four Chalice of the Void. These cards are set in all, in all lists, uh, no matter whether they play with uh, Rebel Master or... Uh, we just talked a week, up, a, week, a week ago and I told you, yeah, 40 cards and you said, yeah, fill up the rest of the 20 cards how you want. But Pretty much. Um, the good stuff about the deck at the moment is that they most of the list adds four copies of Ensnaring Bridge. So you have one more unfair factor in the deck than previous lists. Previous lists, if we call it Dragon Stompy, played stuff like oh, Rectus Pit Dragon. Uh, no, nah, nah, not not so long. I'm a <laughs> bit more actual stuff like like Sin Brother. Oh yeah. Or this Goblin Stompy with Mock Catcher. Oh, Mock Catcher. But meanwhile, you just play the eight moons, the four chalices, the four Ensnaring Bridge, and four copies of, in my opinion, one of the best red cards in Legacy, Fiery Confluence. That's a great card. Red that does all you want. My favorite is when you go Mod Catcher into Goblin Settler, and then you start blowing up their last <laughs> basic lands, and they're like, ah, I got them. And then you just crush them. Yeah, in, I, I had this deck, and in theory it was cool, but playing it at the tournament, having a bridge in hand against an enemy show and tell, or against uh, reanimate, or even against Tarmogoyf, which can raise you with uh, your goblins, was just stronger than any red creatures. Yeah, and a lot of decks, I guess, they even struggle dealing with it in the main deck, especially in the face of Blood Moon, um, which makes it much harder to cast stuff like Collagen's Command. And yeah, and like you mentioned, the Fury Confluence, I think that's actually the card that does set the deck apart, that makes it even better than it used to, because like previous iterations of the deck, they struggled dealing with Planeswalkers. Um, they didn't have the, the Ensnaring Bridge that you mentioned. And now you can actually play sometimes like even like kind of a burnout game. Like the, the, sometimes I've I've seen it happen to me. The deck actually kills you just with direct damage, like yep. combined Mono Chandra. Red burn control. Yeah, yeah, that's what it feels like. I've I've died to like Chandra activation plus six to my face many times now. And Chandra is another card that feels really really good in that deck. As as a as a friend of mine of mine said uh, when he wanted to join us uh, of a weekly legacy tournament in 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 Ingolstadt. Do you want to play Death and Texas or do you want to play Moon Stompy? Ah, give me Moon Stompy, but but guy, <laughs> Death and Texas, it's 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 much more fun. And he said, I uh, don't need fun. It's enough for me if my opponents do not have fun. And he won the tournament. I like this guy. Which is, <laughs> I guess, he had a lot of fun. You even played against him, Vincent. You know, yeah. He cleared your board twice, and then he beat Mark Fogt with the Seaman Spirit Guide. Oh, oh yeah, I remember. I played against him in the quarterfinals. <laughs> yeah. That tournament. Yes. Yeah, when we played in that underground dungeon. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that was so weird on that island. <laughs> One of the few decks I played, which is good against elves, really is Chandra Control. Let's call it Chandra Control or the Blood Moon Control. Sounds good. Sounds good. Which is weird because in the past I always went on record saying that any deck playing Chalice is disadvantaged against elves, but I can't say that anymore because Four Color Loam is slightly advantaged against elves, and this deck certainly is advantaged against us. Like I really don't want to face it. Uh, which is like this deck is prop. Like this deck and lands are the main reasons I reincluded Progenitors back into my elves list and most of my elves lists because you can't really grind them out anymore because of the mess removal. Yep. And even there, you can struggle against the Ensnaring Bridge. Yeah, true. Like in the past, if they went turn one Chalice, they usually didn't really do anything meaningful for quite a while. Eventually, they would play like a stupid beater that you can still blank with a Wild Symbiote that you would get off Senate, and eventually you would just win. But now they have mass removal, and it gets so much harder. So to me, if you, if you want to pick something that's very, very 
strong and you don't really have a ton of experience in the meta game right now but you like matt for example if you could make it and i know that you would play c trino anyway but to anyone who's got access to the cards and who wants to have fun and I, honestly i would have fun playing that kind of deck I'm, I'm that kind of person i would certainly recommend playing this deck at seattle because like turn one blood moon steals so many games same goes for chalice and it's just it's great it's it's an amazing deck. I so like it the moral of this podcast since the very, 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 very beginning, since episode one, was play Blood Moon. And now we're at episode, <laughs> what, 46? We're still telling you, play yeah. Blood Moon. Uh, I've, I, okay, now this is kind of crazy. Marius talked about how greedy everyone is in four-color control and check pile. I've actually seen check pile lists who played Blood Moon in the sideboard because they have two basic lands and four Deathfall champions. And they're like, yeah, we can get there. Let's just like screw the other guy. And that seems to be kind of like the, the motto, the slogan of the format right now, like screw the non-basics. Like whether it's, I don't know, Choke, which usually gets a ton of non-basics because nobody plays Basic Island anymore, or it's Blood Moon, or it's Back to Basics. People just really, really hate non-basic lands in the format right now, which might be one of the reasons why High Tide in the hands of Marcus Ewald, Truckis, has been so popular, and I know the guys in the Brainstorm show recently even did an entire episode about it. I don't know how good High Tide is. It's, it's just like it does something completely, completely different from what most people are doing. And it's probably just underpowered, if you ask me. And <laughs> that's probably, like, Marcos would probably even agree. But, yeah, it just popped into my head that, like, I would love to see somebody playing high tide in a field of, hey, screw your non-basics. And he's like, oh, don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> and you can play back to basics yourselves. Oh, you could. You could, actually. <laughs> Next level. <laughs> Uh, maybe somebody's gonna splash back to basics in one of his four color decks or <laughs> make it like yeah. I was I was playing in four color Nick fit oh uh, uh, there you have it <laughs> <laughs> a card I, I recently dreamt about uh, talking about enchantments is recurring nightmare I actually had a dream about playing recurring nightmare and elves to just get value of the visionaries and uh, when it's the final turn you just get back Krata of Beermoth which was countered or something <laughs> it's way too cute but yeah apparently like non-basic lands and enchantments that's currently the, the big hidden fight that the format is fighting i mean re realistically what would happen if somebody showed up with enchantress and was like solitary confinement grixis delver enjoy people do on magic online um they actually play a little bit more of enchantress these days they usually play doomvik giant fuck that card it, it has cost me many games i would love to see somebody like pick up enchantress and just do a, maybe I, i'm gonna record a leak run with it if somebody wants to like donate not do donate <laughs> but um lend out the cards to me i would certainly record a leak with enchantress if you guys want to see that happen so hit me up on twitter but with that we are gonna conclude today's cast uh thanks marius for coming on thanks matt for getting up in the morning i think it was pretty early for you to record yeah it was decently early yeah thank you. you're welcome with that i want to thanks uh thank all the listeners thank you guys and matt how can people reach you if they want to talk to you they can. I know that you've been banned from Twitter and stuff. Yeah, yeah, the Twitter people don't like me. It's just uh, <laughs> maybe uh, they should just like schedule an appointment in your your dentist's office at the is it University of Vancouver? Must have some British, fancy name, right? British Columbia. Yeah. British Columbia. Oh, even bigger. Okay. <laughs> Marius, how can people contact you? They usually contact me, and I forward it via, fa via Facebook. Marius Hausmann. I'm on Facebook. And you're also Marius on the of the Moon. Yeah, Marius of the Moon on uh, MTG Online, correct. Or they might see you running around with your new fancy red dress that you got from Magic Heart Market, <laughs> which is your new sponsor, by the way. Magic Heart Market yeah. putting up an, a really, really amazing series um, on Magic Online. On Magic Online, no, in Europe right now. And honestly, like. I don't want to talk about this too much, but I've been really, really impressed with how professional the events have gotten because I've been to almost every single one event ever since the series was created three years ago. I only yep, the round time. The round time is better. The prizes are great at the moment, so I can really encourage all guys from Europe to come to the MKM series. Yeah, and I also really like that they recently restarted um, uh, having video coverage, which to me it's one of the biggest things if you want to grow your series. And when I was in the coverage area in, in Rome, um, it was super, super professional. Like, I remember how it was quite a while ago. It, it was like this random guy from Austria with his laptop and he showed up and started streaming. But now it's like, I've been to, to the US and I've been in Star City Games feature matches and MKM almost feels like it's on that level. They still don't have the manpower. They probably could use a little more, a greater number of people to work on that. But 
they they are using what they've got and they're doing a pretty decent job with it. And I can only see it becoming even better and even bigger right now. And that really, really makes me happy because like I enjoy playing on the series. And I think the next one is gonna be Hamburg in right after Eternal Weekend. No, it's it's after the GP. Yeah, it's after the GP. Yeah, it's Birmingham. Eternal Weekend, then Birmingham, then Hamburg. And I'm gonna be at all of them. <laughs> uh, it's a bit of pity. I, I've got a, I've got a buy for Hamburg, but can't come because a friend of my wife has a wedding. And yeah. Oh, I, I thought you said like a probation hearing, and you have to show up. And no, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so everyone, thanks for tuning in. Check us out on. Well, you probably found us via itsjulian.com. Uh, you can contact me on Twitter at itsjulian23. You can find me on Magic Online julian23. But overall, like if you want to contact me, I really prefer you know, using Twitter. I get a lot of your messages on on facebook but they are sometimes hidden and then i only discover them later so if you want to hit me up just just contact me on twitter and with that thanks for everyone for tuning in good luck at the gp let me know how you guys fared and see you next time bye bye, bye.